Thank you so much, <clears throat> my elder, elder, uh, Thomas O'Bank, for this um, powerful prayer. Uh, good evening, church. Uh, our Pastor Paul is supposed to be teaching us tonight, but um, he has uh, taken um, permission because he'll be running late because of the nature of his work. So um, I'll be um, taking us tonight, and uh, when he joins us, he will also fellowship with us. We thank you, Lord, for giving us the support to come before your throne of grace once again, O Lord. We say, dear Lord, Father Almighty, to anoint the tongue that will deliver this message, O Lord. Speak through me, Father Almighty, anoint your message. Consecrate all the hearts that are gathered tonight, O Lord, that we hear also, O Lord. And give us a discerning heart, Father, to be able, O Lord, to know the truth, to know your words, to get your message, and to let all the seeds that are going to be sown tonight, O oh Lord, find Father grants in our hearts. We thank you, Lord, in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ, Father, we thank you. Amen. The final uh, chapter of um, First Peter, it's one of the, the, the most important uh, letters that uh, Apostle Peter wrote to the Jews um, in the early church. And um, incidentally, it, it also touches almost uh, every, every uh, aspect of our life today. It, it's more of a, an epistle or a letter that is based on manifestation of grace and hope. 
we've been had or uh, we've been we've got the opportunity of grace being preached to us many times. But how do we understand grace? How does grace manifest itself? And how is grace re related to hope in our life? So, so this is what uh, we are going to to to, to deal with tonight. Because we re reading through that uh, First Peter chapter five, what 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 we see that everything is based on grace. Every argument, every every sentence of uh, Apostle Peter is based on grace. Is based on grace. So, what is grace? How does grace manifest itself? So, so I'm, I'm going to read the whole chapter of uh, that um, chapter five. I want you to come to, to read along with me. It, it, it said, to the elders among you, I appear as a fellow elder and a witness of Christ's suffering who also will share and the glory to be revealed. Be shepherd of God's flock that is under your care, watching over them, not because you must, but because you are willing as God wants you to be, not pursuing this honest gain, but eager to serve, not lording it over those entrusted to you, but being examples to the flock. And when the chief shepherd appears, you will receive the crown of glory that we never fade away. In the same way, you who are younger, submit yourselves to your elders. All of you clothe yourselves with humility towards one another because God opposes the proud but shows favor <clears throat> to the humble. Verse 8. Humble yourselves therefore under God's mighty hand that he may lift you up in due time. Cast all your anxiety on him because he cares for you. Be alert and of sober mind. Your enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. Resist him, standing firm in the faith because you know that the family of believers throughout the world is undergoing the same kind of sufferings. And the God of all grace, who called you to his eternal glory in Christ, after you have suffered a little while, will he himself restore you and make you strong, firm, and steadfast. To him be the power forever and ever. Amen. And then he gives us the final greetings in verse 12. With the help of Silas, whom I regard as a faithful brother, I have written to you, bravely encouraging you and testifying that this is the true grace of God. Stand fast in it. She who is in, Be in Babylon, chosen together with you, sends you her greetings. And so does my son Mark. Greet one another with a kiss of love. Peace to all of you who are in Christ Jesus, the word of God. This is very, very interesting indeed. I was reading through it, and a lot of questions were just propping up in my, my, in my mind, in my mind, in my mind, that I said, my God, this is one of the best letter that uh, Peter has written, as if to say he was even writing to us today. He said, Peter, Peter addressed himself at, in, in this letter as an elder. And also, he, 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 he counted himself as part of them, as part of the, 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 the flock, I mean, part of the elders in the church. Even though he, 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 he was the rock, he, he witnessed Jesus' suffering. And that is why he mentioned here that the Peter understood that so were the idea of grace, having witnessed the grace of God in both of his content. He, he witnessed the suffering of Jesus Christ, he witnessed it. And also, as an elder, he wrote to them. He said, the grace of God seen in the person of Jesus Christ. The gracious way that God has formed the Jewish nation in order to bring Jesus onto the earth. The love displayed in allowing Jesus to die for our sins 
and then raised him from the dead to show that it was God and that the authority to forgive sin and save man from eternal destruction. Peter was our eyewitness to all of these events that demonstrated God's grace in saving mankind. If you remember, let me take your mind back again. Jesus Christ told us that he volunteered to die for us sin, that nobody forced him. It was his life, he had the right to take it. Even though when he was, because as we understood, he was completely 100% human being, so he too had to undergo the fear of death. And at the last hour, he, they, they said his sweat was like blood. He said, Father, if it were possible, let this cup flow over me. But he remembered, he said, but not my will, but thy will be done. So which means that under, under persecution, under death, we too could be scared. Peter was scared, even though Peter was the, the, the bravest of the disciples. He denied Jesus Christ three times before the, the, the cock crow once. But Jesus Christ had already prayed for him because Jesus Christ knew that he was going to do that. Because he, 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 he was just like you and I in flesh. But Jesus Christ paid the price so that we would not have to be killing bulls and, 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 and cow and, 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 and doves every year for atonement of our sin. But God prepared a nation, the, Jew, the Jewish nation, if he prepared them for this second redemption plan of, of, of his, because after, after, after our, 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 our uh, uh, first parents, Adam and Eve, they, they lost out. They lost out the eternity. They lost out the gift of God because of that disobedience in the Garden of Eden. But God had a second plan. And that is the redemption plan because that it has to take the blood, the blood of a human being and not ordinary human being to restore us back to glory. And if you remember again, when the, when the, the high priest and all of them were arguing about, about the, the, the popularity of Jesus Christ and the, and the, and the, the consequences of the Roman Empire coming to, to come and um, um, kill all the people because of the, uh, of the confusion going on in Jerusalem. Caiaphas said it is better for one man to die than for the whole of Israel to be killed by the Romans. He didn't even know that he was saying he was fulfilling the prophecy of Jesus Christ. He didn't know that. And what he was saying at that time was it is better for us to kill Jesus Christ rather than for the Romans to come and kill all of us because of this confusion between Christians, the, the new believers, and, 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 and the, 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 the fanatical Jews. So Jesus Christ paid the price and, and Peter witnessed the crucifixion and the resurrection. So that is what he is saying here. That 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 that, that the, 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 the Son of Man had the power to forgive sin. So Peter was an eyewitness to all of these events that demonstrated God's grace in saving mankind. Peter also understood the idea of grace from a personal perspective, as he experienced the, the changes that God, grace, work in himself and others who believe in Jesus. His first episode is a demonstration and explanation of what grace means to one who has been touched by it. We All of us have been touched one way or the other during our course of life by grace. But but let us let us instead of illuminate what the grace is, looks like, may, maybe you can find a, 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 a place where, where it relates to your own life. The grace means a sense of security from the fear of condemnation. Grace means a sense of security from the fear of condemnation. What do you mean by that? We casually say, I'm saved by grace. I am saved by grace. I am saved. But what do we really understand by I am saved by grace? So which, which, which means that 
that safety is not is not due to your own righteousness or your godliness or the work you do for God. But but because of grace of God, which you don't deserve. So that means that grace means a sense of security from the fear of condemnation. Two, grace means a spiritually sober lifestyle, no longer addicted to sin and the world. Grace means a spiritually sober lifestyle, no longer addicted to sin and the world. When you have that grace in you, your life changes completely. You become completely transformed. You don't want to go back to sin again. And that was the argument that Apostle Paul was saying, that should we continue to sin so that grace may abound? He said, no. Because we know that when we are yes sinner, Christ died for us. So, so which means that Jesus or Lord is, is ready to forgive us all the time. All the, but does that, that mean that we will continue to sin so that, so that, so that grace may abound? Also, Paul said, no. So, grace means a spiritually sober lifestyle, no longer addicted to sin and the world. Number three, he said, grace means a heartfelt submission to God's will in every area of life and the peace that comes with it. Submission to God's will. When you have the grace of life in you, the Holy Spirit will let you know God's will. And you will submit yourself to it. You will be, com be completely obedient to the will of God. You don't need to be supervised by anybody. You don't need to be told what to do. Once you got the message, the Holy Spirit will direct you. You'll be your brother's keeper. You don't wait for anybody to do what is was supposed to do in the church of God. If somebody does not do it, you go ahead and do it. We don't, you don't even complain. Because you enjoy to do it. And then grace means living in harmony with others who have experienced God's love and salvation. When, you be, when, when, when the grace of God abounds in you, That personality of toxicity in you is completely removed. You don't become a toxic person again. You become an adorable, a loving person that people can relate with. People can easily come to you. People can ask you questions. People can talk to you without fear of being rebuffed, without fear of being insulted, without fear of being humiliated, without fear. Or being scorned, people will come to you. People will be, will be approachable because they see the grace of God live dwelling in your life, in you, in the way you carry yourself, in the way you talk, in your body language. They will see grace of God in you. And then grace means living in harmony with others. And then grace means suffering at times because those who are saved from the world are often no longer welcome in it. Grace means suffering at times because those who are saved from the world are often no longer welcome in it. So when you have that grace of God, you must have gone through so many trials. You must have gone through fire a, a, a reformation. You become a new a, a new person. You become a, 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 a as as Apostle Paul said that all things have passed away. Then you become a new creature in, in Christ Jesus. And the minute you become a new creature in, Jesus, in Christ Jesus, you don't go back again to sin. You don't go back again to adulation. You don't go back again to all those things that you have already shared before. You become a new person in Christ. And that is what grace does for you. So in this chapter, we will look at the final meaning that Peter ascribed to grace. The last thing he says that grace does to our character when it touches us. There is an old saying that goes, we have been saved to serve. We have been saved to serve. What does that mean? I am sure you'll be thinking about Jesus Christ 
demonstrated servant leadership because he also washed the feet of the disciples. Then Peter refused that, Lord, you are not going to wash my feet. But, but, but Jesus Christ said, if I don't wash your feet, you are not part of me. So we have been saved to serve. You see, God extends his grace to us so that we will become a channel through which his grace can reach other people. Do you understand that? He said, God extends his grace to us, all of us, not even pastors alone, but all leaders, all Christians. God extends his grace to all of us so that we will become a channel through which his grace can reach others in evangelism. And that is one of them. In ushering in the church, because the ushers are always the first, the, the first encounter with a new visitor in the church, the way the ushers receive them is the way they will come back again. Is the way they will see it, 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 they are the window of the church. And they be eager to say, oh, these people are very friendly. They welcome us. They respect us. They usher us to go and sit. They, they are not rude to us. And the same thing goes with the congregation too. Like our general Vasya was saying the other day, that there's a sister in the church that had come for the past four, uh, six Sundays now. How many of us are going to say, uh, hello, how are you, sister? How are your family? How many of us? She, she comes to church, greet everybody, and then go away. Nobody, 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 nobody talks to her. It is not good. We are all in this together. That is what he's saying here. Our faith and salvation find meaning and satisfaction as we begin to serve God in the work of seeking and saving others. Our faith and salvation find meaning and satisfaction as we begin to serve God in the work of seeking and saving others. How many times have we deemed it fit to, to just pick up the phone and call some of our members in the church that to, to, uh, to tonight is Bible study class? Can you join us? I'm sure you are going to enjoy it. I am calling to just to check up on you. Tomorrow is Sunday. I believe the COVID is out, is, is gone now. Are we going to go to church together? Can we go to church together, my sister or my brother? That is what we are expected to do. Peter uses elders as the ultimate example of God's grace at work in the church. A person could not aspire to a more meaningful or, or gracious role in God's kingdom than to serve his church as an elder. It is not like the pictures I exposed today when a pastor is riding on the back of the congregation or when a pastor is being, is being guided by, 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 by armed, armed, armed men and it's because he definitely knew that this is riding on the sweat of the people as we are witnessing all over in Africa. No. They are not serving God. They are not Christ-centered churches. They are all man-centered churches. And Christ has already warned us to be expecting such kind of churches towards the advent of the end times. So Peter uses elders as the ultimate example of God's grace at work in the church. A person could not aspire to a more meaningful or gracious role in God's kingdom than to serve his church as an elder. Peter doesn't describe the work of an elder. No, he did not prepare any SOP for that. He did not give us any job description of, of an elder. In this is in, in, in this context because he assumes everyone knows that an elder's role is one of complete service it's not missing what he said is complete service so 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 which means there's no limitation of of what elder is supposed to do what elder is not supposed to do or what what what, what are the limits where elder can stop and, and then somebody else take over no 
No. So Paul explains in his letter to, the, to, to Timothy and Titus, not only the elder's character, but the work that he has been assigned to do. Because we have already treated that one in, in, when we were, when we were uh, 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 studying Timothy. And that was the time we, 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 were, we were able to read the, the job prescription for, for elders, for deacons, for bishop, for all these, etc. But this includes teaching for, for, for an elder. It includes teaching. It includes offering hospitality. It includes encouraging the brethren and defending the church against false teachers and their doctrine. I want you to notice this one. And defending the church against false teachers and their doctrines. How can we elders? How can we elders help the church to defend the church against false teachers and their doctrines when we too are not grounded in the word of God? How can we be the defender of the faith? When they have to beg us to come to Bible study class. How can we as elders. When we don't even know the passages of the Bible. They have to force us to read the Bible. Being an elder in the church is not a decorative, a honorary position or status. It is, it is the gift of the Holy Spirit. Because the Holy Spirit lead the leader to say to, to, to look at you say this this this, this uh, 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 person has been in the church and has demonstrated a lot of things that that qualify him or her as an elder in the church. And when you become an elder in the church, when you become an elder in the church, we will normally expect from you to be able to teach to be able to offer hospitality, to be able to encourage the brethren and defending the church against false teachers and false doctrines. You cannot give what you don't have. You cannot defend the faith. You cannot help the church against false teachers if you are not grounded in the word of God. And that is what we are talking about tonight. Peter reminds them that an important part of an elder's responsibility is to lead. And he uses this opportunity to teach them not only that grace produces leaders who serve, but leaders who serve in a particular way. There may be also confusion as to the authority and role of the elders among those to whom he is writing, because he's writing to them, to, 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 to those elders in, in, in Jews in those days. But so, so Peter explained that grace produces leaders who serve in the spirit of Christ, so that there shouldn't be any confusion at all. Because when we are, if, if, if we go into the politics of the church, then we have divisions, we have classes, we have status. But when, but when we go into the church in the spirit of Christ, then every, everything, a, a, a slave is not greater than his master. So, so that verse 1 says, Therefore, I exhort you, the elders among you. He said, Therefore, I exhort the elders among you as your fellow elder and witness of the suffering of Christ and a partaker also of the glory that is to be, to be revealed. The apostle offers this exhortation, a, a word of encouragement and motivation to specific people, that is to elders. In the New Testament, there were three words that refer to the leaders in the church, all pointed to the same person, but describing him in a different way. So, so in the New Testament, there are only one, oh, the same person is being described in three different ways. He described the elder as shepherd, which today we, 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 we call pastor. As a shepherd, today we regard as pastor. 
Who are they? Who are the pastors? Who are shepherding the church? You see, Peter, you see, the pastor referred to the way a man carried out his leadership role. The imagery of caring, of protective, nurturing shepherd was used to describe the men who were to lead the church by shepherding them and doing this by caring, by nurturing, and by protecting the members of the congregation. We get the word pastor from this word an idea. In other words, what is the word, uh, what is the work of a shepherd? A shepherd is to take care of the flock. A shepherd is to, to protect the flock. A shepherd is to feed the flock. If you remember again, the general pastor was asking us, uh, was telling us the, 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 the encounter of uh, Peter and Jesus Christ. When, when, when Jesus Christ asked Peter, Peter, do you love me? He said, yes, I love you. He said, feed my sheep. And, and the Lord asked him again, Peter, do you love me? <laughs> Peter said, of course you know I love you. <sighs> and the Lord asked the third time again, Peter, do you love me? Peter said, my God, but do you know that I love you? Feed my sheep, attend to my sheep, nurture them. So that is the work of a shepherd. The shepherd laid down his life for his sheep. But, uh, and, and the Lord was comparing between a shepherd and a hiring. A hiring is somebody that is hired, that is not a shepherd. He is not the shepherd of the flock, but he's a hired hand. And when the wolves come now, he runs away and leaves the sheep alone. He runs away because he has no obligation to protect the sheep. But a shepherd will not do that. A pastor will not do that. A pastor will lay down his life for his flock. So that is what Apostle Peter is referring to here, which from what we've also been thought all along. So, so we can we can say confidently that we understand. The, 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 the responsibility of a shepherd, which is a shepherd, which is a pastor. But this is not what we are witnessing today in Africa among our Pentecostal new generation pastors. They are ravenous wolves in sheep's clothing. And then the second definition of an elder is a bishop or overseer. You see, these are terms that stress the authority given by God to these men if they qualify for them. Because we have so many bishops today. I have so many bishops in my former church that don't even have two churches under him. And, 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 and um, his own church is also in, his, in, in the basement of his house, but he call himself a bishop. So, but, but that is not, we are not talking about those people, about, about this kind of people, but in, 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 in the real context, if they qualify, sometimes they were used to describe the leader or a shepherd who was leading the church. They refer to those who were responsible for the work within the church. In the in the Orthodox churches, when you become a bishop, if when you become a bishop, it means you have more or three or four or six parishes under you. If you are managing only one parish, if you are managing only one church, you are called a reverend. You are called a precipiter. But the moment you are now supervising two or three churches, four churches, you will become a bishop. And then so on and so on and so then, then until you are now able to, to manage a, a complete state. And that is where you become an archbishop. And then and then the final reserve we, we then we have error. The elder, now this word was used to describe the same person, what stressing is maturity and experience. Within the same sentences you quote, have all these three of these words, but they will be referring to the same man, elders exercising oversight in pastoring their flock, elders exercising oversight in pastoring their flock. 
as time went on, these times we are given to different people with different levels of authority. Like bishops, we are responsible for pastors and new titles as well as levels of authority we are added as archbishop, cardinal, and pope, depending on the denomination of the church. So this we are not based on the authority of scriptures, no, or reflected the gradual uh, falling away from the early church practice of carefully following the apostles' teaching on these matters. You see, during Peter's ministry in the in the fourth century, the terms elder, shepherd, pastor, overseer, bishop, and presbyter were all words that describe the character, the authority and the work of a church leader. Not different types of leaders, no. Each congregation had more than one leader and their authority was always limited to the local congregation. But Peter counts himself among this group because I, 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 aside from, from being an apostle who had been called by Jesus Christ and witnessed his baptism, his death, and resurrection, he also served as an elder in the church at Jerusalem. If you remember again, because Apostle Paul accused him that before, before, before the delegation from Jerusalem came to us in, in, in Antioch, you, Peter, were eating with the Gentiles. But as soon as these people came from Jerusalem, you, 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 you excite, I mean, you sort of Remove yourself completely. And that was what now led to the, the, the Jerusalem Council about the Gentiles. How do we treat the Gentiles? Because the argument was that if these Gentiles received the gift of the Holy Spirit in the same way and manner that we received it, like Peter said, who am I to command that water should not be, this water should, I mean, that I should command the water that these people should not be baptized. They receive the gift of the Holy Spirit in the same way. So in other words, God is no respecter of any person. The same way he gave us the gift of the Holy Spirit, he gave it also to the Gentiles. So why should we discriminate against them? Why should we add to their yoke? Why should we impose conditions upon them when, when we are saved by grace? So the elders met in Jerusalem. They said, Peter said, okay, let elders meet in Jerusalem and whatever the son we, we take, we will refer back to you. And that was when they said that, okay, we will not insist that the genders had to be circumcised because that was a personal covenant between the chosen people of God, the, the, the Jews and God. From Father Abraham, because God told Abraham, go and circumcise your children, all your male children, as a covenant between me and you. And that does not extend to the Gentiles. But we must tell the Gentiles not to eat food strangled to idols. Not to eat food meat offered to idols. Not to eat blood. To abstain from fornication, from adult adulteration, from all these things, they must they must completely uh, 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 um, they must completely leave all these practices behind them and follow God. So that was what that was what they said. So so now, so Apostle Peter now, so Apostle Peter now told them that. They must abstain from blood. They must abstain completely from everything that is offered to idol. So, so that was what Apostle, Apostle, Apostle Paul said. And that is what Apostle Peter is, is also referring to here. So he teaches them how grace affects the service of those who lead in the church. So now, we're now saying, so we are now saying, that one shepherd willingly. No, that that that's uh, that that's uh, uh, verse two. He said, 
it, it, it shepherd the flock of God among you, exercising oversight not under compulsion, but voluntarily according to the will of God, shepherd willingly. So, 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 it's now telling them that they have to shepherd willingly. He said, shepherd the flock of God among you, exercising authority, oversight, not under compulsion, but voluntarily according to the word of God. He tells them to shepherd, to feed, and take care of the flock because this is their primary responsibility. The flock belongs to the shepherd. And they are responsible for the direction, for the feeding, and for the protection of that flock. They have help in doing this, that is the deacons, the preachers, teachers, saints. But it is their flock and they are the ones who will answer to God for the souls won or the souls lost. Not these others. In connection with he also say that they are to shepherd willingly not grudgingly. It should be a work eagerly done, not something they have to be reminded of or pressured onto. Shepherding should also be done according to God's will. And in the next verses, he described what that should look like. So before we ask question. The second part of verse 2, 2b, two he said, And not for solid gain, but with eagerness. You serve willingly, but not for solid gain, but with eagerness. There are many reasons why some men will want to lead in the church. Many reasons why some men want to lead in the church. One is prestige and pride. The second one is desire to exercise power. And the third one is financial gain, especially those who preach and teach in leadership. What do we mean by that? You see, Peter says that grace motivates men to become elders because they are eager to give something, not gain something. To give something, not gain something. So before we now go to verse 3, can we just have a, a, a kind of a, a bird's eye view or a perspective of what is going on in the world today? How do we reconcile the lifestyle of, the, of this uh, uh, evangelical grandeur pastors and what Apostle Peter is saying here? What should be the yardstick of, of, of the lifestyle of, of elders? When I say elders, it encompasses all, all the servants of God, from, from, from a bishop, archbishop, down to, to, to a minister in the church. Can somebody just give us their own personal in, in impression about, about what they think should be the lifestyle of, of, of uh, uh, the, the pastors that will be acceptable to God, or of the, of the elders that will be acceptable to God? Can somebody give us their own impression, their own idea, their own um, um, opinion of, of the lifestyle of what should be the, the lifestyle of, a, of an elder in the church? That when I say elder, it means all of them together. Can somebody give us an idea? Yes, sir. Thank you. 
Because the living is that increase their life in this farm, in living in, in, in the power and in the strength of Jesus Christ, not in our own power, not in our own strength, not in living under, but, but living under the control of Jesus Christ, you know, and not under our 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 own self rule. Because when we live under our self rule, that's when we begin to, you know, do the things that you just meant you just mentioned, you know, and that takes us really away. leadership of Jesus Christ. So this, this is about, you know, our Lord when times are good for us. He can, he, he, it doesn't cost us anything to go that way. But there are times when, you know, we, 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 we get tired, we grow weary, we feel defeated. We, we feel as if our circumstances of life is overwhelming, you know. And it is in those moments that we choose between dealing with life in our own strength or remaining, you know, dependent on the Spirit of God living within us. And I think if we if we if we're not very careful this this fine line, you know, that's where sometimes we get twisted and we do the things that, you know, you think, you know what, I've got to this stage, I'm now this, I'm I have got this title, I can do this, I can do that, I need bodyguard, I need to do this for me, I need to do that for me. And that's where that to creep in. So we, we have to be very, very, very careful really, you know. Because it, 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 it talks about being humble, see? And, um, and, and, and God uses a variety of things, you know, to humble us, you know, and we talk about grace, you know, sometimes he uses other people, you know, it, you know, extra grace is required, so sometimes and we need the grace of God, we need the grace of God that, you know, can, 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 can help us. And sometimes he uses tragedy, you know, tragedy and loss just to humble us. You know, even though God may not have sent that calamity your way, but be able to use it for your own good. Okay, we see Romans 8, 20, it says, all things work together for the good of those who love God. Right. So sometimes we'll face challenges just for us, just to humble ourselves. That's right. you know? So those are the things, if we are humble, you know, you know, again, in, the, in, the, in those, um, the, the explanation you gave us about this, he talks about us being dependent as well, casting our care onto him because he cares for us. So we, we, we only have to be humble, but we have to depend on God. He cast our body on, onto him. You know, we don't want to start solving our own problems because we think we have all the answers. All right? And I, I think in Psalm 8 says that we have, you know, we are told to be alert. Right? Right. Mm-hmm. And that means we have to be sober. We have to you know, really mentally alert at all times. And then it talks about temptation. So it, 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 when we go through this chapter, you know, it, it, it gives us the key words there That's right. that we can have to that has a guideline to keep us in line with what we have said as pastors, evangelists, whatever title we're giving, to stay in line with, you know, the, the things of God. Because if we are humble, if we are alert, if we are dependent on the Holy Spirit, all these things are going to help us, you know, in our journey. Thank I'll just stop there. Thank you, sir. <clears throat> Thanks, sir. Yeah, in that verse 3, he said, elders must not lord it over those entrusted to them, but being examples to the flock. He said they must not lord it. What does it mean? You see, in the world, a promotion often means that your job is to organize and direct others to do the heavy lifting and dirty work. In the in the in the corporate world, in the world, as we understood it, when you get promoted, your job is is, is reduced. You share your responsibility to the subordinate under you to do the dirty work, to do the heavy lifting work. But in the church, it is the opposite. Becoming an elder means that a man takes on the responsibility of, of acting like Christ so that the others will know how Christ will act in a given situation. It does not mean that the elder is, 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 is the servant of all of us to do all the spade work, to do all the, the monkey work. Because if we burn him out, 
we will lose him. No. So we don't. We we we, we must not make that kind of mistake at all to say after all, he's an elder. Because there was a time a person was suffering, 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 and, and then one young uh, 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 lady in the church said, "But but that is her calling." I said, "What? Her calling is to die for you? A calling is to burn out?" No. We all owe that responsibility to one another. We have to take care of our pastor. We have to take care of them, to take care of their needs, to call on them, to check up on them, to pray for them. Because they are human beings like us. They are not superhuman. They have the same blood running through their veins. They feel the same pain that we do. They suffer the same stress. But they put their life out on the line for us. And we've got to appreciate them. So elders exercise authority through teaching, through encouragement and loving example and are not to act like lords or kings. And verse 4 says, And when the chief shepherd appears, you will receive the unfolding crown of glory. Definitely you agree with me that the, the, the work is very demanding. But the reward is great also because the elders will receive from the Supreme Shepherd the highest of honor. There's always a discussion about degree of rewards. But the book of Revelation describes the throne of God surrounded one with elders first, then the saints and the angels. So, so in other words, even Jesus Christ himself, he laid emphasis on the importance of elders. He said, in the throne of God, the elders are the first. Before, before it, it now moves to the, to the angels before, and, and then the angels last. And who are the saints? The saints are the, the, the members of the church that live a godly life before they saw death. But the elders are the ones that, that devoted their life like, like uh, the... the, the, the uh, the, the young man we had in the church is the elders in the church that is sweeping the, the whole church, picking the doors, making sure that the church is, in, is clean, and then taking temperature every Sunday. He comes to church before all of us. And he's not a young man. But he's doing this job. He's not paid. We are not paying him. But how many times have we ever, 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 ever even opened our mouth to say, ah, Thank you, sir, for, for, for your service. We never, we just take it for granted. He is not an usher, he's performing the duty of an usher in the church. The ushers are supposed to be behind that table taking temperature every Sunday, but you don't see the usher until maybe the middle of the praise and worship. And yet, this young man will be there taking temperature and greeting every one of us. Good morning, Pastor Lambo. Welcome, Pastor this. Welcome, Sister this. Welcome that. But do we say, thank you, sir? Nobody. We don't. We just take it for granted. So that is what the author is saying here, that in, in that verse 4, that when the chief shepherd appears, you will receive the unfolding crown of glory. So, 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 so God is going to, to recompense himself. Christ is going to pay him himself. And that is what I am trying to emulate to in him. I'm doing my own job without caring about whether anybody thanks me or not. Because of what this author is saying here, the work is demanding, but the reward is great because the elders will receive from the Supreme Shepherd the highest of honor. I want to receive it when I die. So grace creates a leadership that is different from the world. A leadership that is in harmony. A leadership that eagerly wants to serve its charge without complaining. A leadership that submitted to God. A leadership that leads by example and not by decree. And a leadership with its eyes fixed on a heavenly crown, not a worldly one. This means that elders lead with hope and joy, not fear, doubt, or negativeness. So this means that an elders lead with hope and joy. 
and not with fear, doubt, and negativeness. Grace means a responsive congregation. Grace means a responsive congregation. Leaders don't lead in a vacuum. You need the proper response from the congregation in order to have a successful spiritual leadership. Peter explains that grace also affects how the church responds to godly, gracious leadership. How do we respond, Man Zion, to the godly leadership of our leader? Do we honor him? We honor him by obeying him. We honor him by submitting ourselves completely to his commands. We honor him by following his vision. We honor him by appreciating his effort. The only way we can appreciate his effort is to be submissive, to be obedient to his guidance, to his spiritual guidance, because it's not him that is guiding us. It's not his wisdom, but God's wisdom speaking through him. So that is what the author is saying here. Before he now goes to verse 5, which we're going to leave tonight for the next teacher, and that deals with, he said, you younger men, likewise be, sub be subject to your elders, and all of you clothe yourself with humility towards one another. We're going to leave that one for the next teacher, which is coming up, let's say, Dakabo. And Dakabo will be teaching us next, next Wednesday. And he will be the one to start with that verse 5. So now the question that we want to ask ourselves in the next four minutes remaining <coughs> uh, 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 is simple enough. What is how does knowing Peter personally witness Jesus' suffering affect the message? In other words, what we are saying that the, the, the message that Peter has written here, how do you think it affects the message that he has written? It, it, does it mean that because he has witnessed the, 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 life, the life journey of Jesus Christ, he, because Jesus Christ called him, he stayed with Jesus Christ for three years, and he witnessed his death, his suffering, his resurrection. Do you think that there's, there's any reflection in the message? I would rather say yes. Even though we have not seen Jesus Christ, but from what Apostle Peter is writing here, he's writing as, as a witness, as somebody that witnessed the lifestyle of Jesus Christ. And that is servant leadership. He came to serve people. He did not lord his authority over them, even though he had the right to do so. He pleaded with them. He sat with them. He ate with them. And the high priest, the, the Pharisees, the Jews, all of them, they are, all these famous people, they, 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 they challenged him. Why do you eat with sinners? He associated himself with sinners to bring them back to repentance. How many of us leaders the general overseer, the archbishop. Can any member of our church just knock at his door without giving an appointment that I'm coming to see you? And you say, what? Why are you calling me? You, can even, you cannot even call your pastor at 10 o'clock at night. You say, what do you mean? 10 o'clock at night, don't you want me to sleep? But if you are a shepherd of God, you can be called at 12 o'clock at night. And you will not be offended. Say, what can I do for you, my brother, my sister? Are you okay? Is everything all right? That is what he's saying here. And that is what is missing in the church today. There are some churches today, you have to book an appointment before you can see your general basia. We thank God that our pastor Mana is not like that. If you don't call him, he will call you. And then number two, say, what does it mean to be a shepherd leader? What responsibility did Peter remind shepherd leaders that they have? We have leaders online tonight. We have Erda, 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 John Walker, Erda Obeng, Erda Seth, 
So what does it mean to be a shepherd leader? Can you please give us that answer? Or explain to us what does it mean to be a shepherd leader? Because you are all elders in the church. Elder Kagbu, what does it mean to be a shepherd leader? What responsibility did Peter remind shepherd leaders that they have? Yes, sir. Welcome, sir. Let me ask uh, the Kagbo. The Bible reveals that in many ways God cares for Peter. In your own personal experience, what are the ways that you have seen God's hand in your life? Have you ever experienced something you will call a miracle? How, how important is it for you to trust that God is caring for you in supernatural ways? I start off with the first like a testimony to share with us. Yeah, thank you, sir. Well, I mean, it's not so much a testimony. Okay, um, that's good. Um, you know, it, it is always an opportunity to appreciate what God is doing in your life and what He has done. That's right. Um, there are situations in which um, you find yourself. Uh, I have personally found myself. Well, before even coming to the United States, where I, I don't know where, um, you know, where I would lay my head, um, or maybe even what I would eat, because I'm in a foreign country and don't know anyone there. But it, it is amazing that. Um, God will connect you with people that will be a blessing to your life and um, will guide you and actually show you the way. Mm -hmm. So it is a blessing. And we see that, I'm sure a lot of people can testify, even here in the United States, I believe. You know, you find yourself in situations where you are, God will connect you with um, destiny helpers, people just guide you, help you, you know, so, but um, to the, um, uh, uh, first, the previous question, as elders, it is not about what we must do, but it, it, it is not an obligation on you, but it, it, the expectation is that you are, you must be willing because that's what God wants you to be. You must be willing to do the work that the Lord has 
it's expecting of you to do. So that's a, that's a responsibility of an elder. Rather than you just do things that uh, you're told or you are directed to do without you demonstrating that willingness. So I, I think as elders, um, that's the, the example that we ought to demonstrate in the church. Thank you so much. Sir. Thank you, sir. So, um, Elder Kagbo is going to start us off for verse 5 um, next week by the grace of God. And uh, I'm going to post some of these questions on the portal for, for each and every one of us to go through them. And uh, if you like, you can share your experience with us. If you like, you, you can do it as an exercise for yourself and then uh, reconcile yourself with God. So can um, uh, General Basia uh, close us in closing prayer? Thank you. Pastor Mana? Thank you, sir. Yeah. Become the leader that you called us to be in the mighty name of Jesus. Father, we thank you for your servant that you used to teach us tonight. We ask, Lord, that you continue to replenish him in the name of Jesus. We thank you for every word of the light tonight and those who couldn't be on the mic. On the mic. Holy Spirit, I pray that you continue to minister to us in the mighty name of Jesus. That we hear the word of God, it will resonate and also, you know, uh, demonstrate what we have blind so that people would see us and then that yes we are drive blind but we thank you for the word once again we give you praise and we give you all the glory in the name of our lord and savior jesus christ we pray we thank you in tonight amen amen can we all share the grace together please may the grace of our lord and savior jesus christ and the love of god and the sweet fellowship of the Holy Spirit. Rest, remain, and abide with us all. Now and forevermore. Amen. Surely, goodness and mercy shall follow us all the days of our lives. And we shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever and ever. Amen and amen. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. God bless you all. Thank you. Thank you so much. God bless you.